Cold. Biting cold. When I see Edwin Landseer's 1864 oil painting depicting a pair of polar bears violently tearing a red ensign to shreds and crunching on what appear to be human bones, I look to the frigid, icy landscape behind them and imagine the cold hum of the Arctic. Yet the land behind them almost seems itself to be draped in torn canvas rather than snow, being a mixture of browns and grays and blues, rather than the pure white usually associated with the snowy northern regions of the world. Dark, gray clouds gather above, and it feels as if a storm is soon to overtake even the hungering beasts, as if the earth itself is indiscriminately threatening its creatures, having already conquered those that seek to conquer it. This feeling, this triumph of nature over humanity, is reflected in the title of the painting. Man proposes, God disposes. My name is Emmett Hanley. Welcome to the Haunted Gallery. Good evening, ghosts, ghouls, and other creatures of the night. I will be your host for this evening, and I invite you to the grand opening of our haunted gallery. Tonight, for our first foray into dark art, we will explore a rather disturbing work inspired by historical events. But before we move on to tonight's main event, I want you to consider how the painting affected you. I realize some of you may already know a little bit about this particular painting, but for those of you witnessing Man Proposes, God Disposes with Fresh Eyes, I don't want to influence your first impression any more than I already have. Sometimes our preconceptions or stories we've heard can skew our perspective of a work of art, but I want you to consider your own initial reaction and come to your own conclusions before I share mine. What do you see? How does it make you feel? Feel free to pause the video. Does it make you uncomfortable? Do you want to look away? Or does it make you feel as if you can't? Do you have a morbid curiosity, a need? to stare into the eyes of these 150-year-old polar bears? Or are you normal? With your first impression of Man Proposes, God Disposes, you might have thought it was creepy, or distasteful, or that it was totally metal. But now that you have viewed the painting for the first time, and had a moment to collect some thoughts, I'm going to present to you with three different, yet vital pieces of context that might change how you see this painting. Of course, I'll be talking about the time and history that led to the creation of this work, and about the artist's life, but first, I want to enlighten you about how this painting has affected other people who have seen it. Now comes the first and most important piece of background that one should have when viewing this particular artwork. The painting you have just witnessed is cursed. <laughs> Today, the panoramic painting hangs in the Royal Holloway, a part of the University of London in the UK. Thomas Holloway, the co-founder of the institution, in purchasing this piece broke a record at the time for the highest sum ever paid at an auction for a contemporary painting. It decorates the walls of an exam hall, yet whenever exam season comes around, a Union Jack is always draped over the painting through the duration of any testing. It is uncertain when the tradition began, but it appears at some point during the painting's history a disturbing urban legend began to shroud its presence. A long time ago, a student was struggling during an English literature exam and was sitting in a seat nearest to the painting. The student was visibly agitated, mumbling incoherently and making nearby students uncomfortable. They stared at the painting, desperately scribbling what others assumed to be answers on their test. Yet none could have expected the tragedy that was about to unfold before their very eyes. The student stood at their desk, and clutched a freshly sharpened pencil in their hand. The student plunged the pointed tip of their writing utensil right through their eye, penetrating their brain. Needless to say, the student didn't survive this incident. The exam was halted, and when someone picked up the student's exam sheet to see what they had written, there was one phrase scrawled on their paper over and over and over again. 
The polar bears made me do it. To this day, it is said that those who write their exams in the seat nearest to the painting are sure to expect a failing grade at best, and at worst, violently bad luck. Many claim that staring at the painting for prolonged periods of time can cause you to lose hold of your sanity entirely. The university takes the curse seriously enough to cover the painting during exams, and if students walk into the exam hall to write their finals and see that this procedure has not been followed, they will refuse to write their exams until the painting is obscured. Who knows what the polar bears could make any of them do. I'm certain that many of you who have come across this video stumbled upon it because you've heard of the cursed polar bear painting and were interested in hearing more. Perhaps you've done a little bit of your own research, or seen it in a haunted paintings or creepy art compilation video on this very website, and I'm sure those of you who have looked into it have noticed some of the inconsistencies between the story I have presented and the others that exist on the internet. Some say that this incident took place in the 1970s, and others in the 20s, 30s, or 40s. One account I found listed the exam as English literature, but cited no source whatsoever as to where they got that little bit of information. Some specify that the student just sat there, staring at the polar bear's eyes before running out of the room and killing themselves elsewhere. And in some iterations of the story, the student didn't write, the polar bears made me do it, but just the bears over and over on their exam paper. Was the student really mumbling incoherently? Why did someone even bother to pick up the paper while their classmate was dying on the floor in front of them? It's a hell of a way to cheat on a test. Did this ever really happen? And perhaps most importantly, what or who is actually haunting this painting? Edwin Landseer was a prodigy. Born in London in 1802, his aptitude for art soon became apparent. His father, who had spent his life in the engraving business, saw little use for conventional schooling for his artistically inclined son, and encouraged him to draw and etch and paint. Even from his young age, Edwin's subjects tended to be primarily animals and at that mostly dogs. By the time he was only 13 years old, his art was being displayed in the Royal Academy. He was encouraged by older contemporary artists such as Benjamin Robert Hayden to study animal anatomy up close, to dissect various beasts in order to fully understand their musculature and the structure of their skeletons. And Landseer complied, taking even the opportunity to dissect the bodies of lions for close study, all in pursuit of art. Evidently it worked, and Landseer continued producing painting after painting, all while garnering critical acclaim and public fame as he got older. Many of his portraits were of pets in their benign lives, yet certain paintings hinted towards darker subject matter. 1821's Alpine Mastiffs reanimating a distressed traveler, for example, depicts two of the titular Mastiffs unearthing a frozen corpse from a snowy mountain pass. One dog hurriedly digs at the snow, barking desperately to draw the attention of the figures in the background, while the other only uses a single paw to half-heartedly uncover the cadaver, licking the bluish, frost-bitten hand of this unlucky man in fine green clothes. To me, this painting conveys hopelessness. The title of the painting betrays its clearly defined subject. This traveler is dead not in any state of distress. No amount of digging or hand licking will stimulate any response. The dogs can attempt to reanimate the man, but he's dead, clearly having been caught unprepared in the dead of winter. I think this painting foreshadows man proposes, God disposes, yet doesn't quite make the same statement. Here there is at least certainty of the recovery of this man's body. He will be properly posthumously taken care of. The polar bears, well, they don't have the same tact. While Landseer produced other paintings in this era with similar subject matter, such as 1829's Attachment, many of Landseer's more mundane portraits of dogs spoke to observation of class and human nature. Landseer reached his peak in the 1820s and 30s. One of his more famous works of this era, a distinguished member of the Humane Society, is a personal favorite of mine. Look at him. His name is Bob. He's a good boy. He's a good boy. Landseer's paintings were his foothold into high society, befriending and painting many portraits of many prominent noble families. He even caught the attention of Queen Victoria and went on to teach her how to etch. Yet, 1840 saw a distinct shift in the artist's life and following suit, his art. Landseer suffered a mental breakdown that he would never fully recover from. Though, the reason it occurred is 
the subject of much speculation. Some insist it was instigated due to his proposal of marriage to the Duchess of Bedford being rejected, and others claim it was the death of his mother, and more still insist that it was the criticisms of his peers and overwork. Most likely it was the culmination of several of these factors that brought about this unfortunate incident in his life, and it changed him. Lancier's life from this point onwards was marked with bouts of depression and melancholia, which of course were only made worse by his substance abuse, not limited to a dependency on alcohol. Over the next 20 years, his personal relationships became strained as he consistently procrastinated on commissions, sometimes for several years, and he found himself not being able to finish creative projects that he started. Relatable content, brother. <laughs> Yet, despite this, he produced several paintings, if not the ones he was supposed to. His subject matter remained similar, albeit slowly getting much, much darker, such as 1844's The Otter Hunt. Yet. His tamer and more popular images of the period were greatly inspired by his many trips to the Scottish Highlands, including what is most likely his most famous painting, 1851's The Monarch of the Glen, which has unfortunately been sentenced to capitalistic marketing hell. Into the 1860s, Landseer's mental health continued to deteriorate. He would become extremely irritable and prone to fits of anger, as well as frequent nightmares, one of which was illustrated in 1862's aptly titled My Last Night's Nightmare. He was confined at several points with a prominent doctor out in the country away from society, and one Lord Frederick Hamilton once described him as a dangerous homicidal maniac. He was likely exaggerating, but despite his condition, Edwin Landseer continued to paint. It was at this point in 1864 when Landseer completed Man Proposes, God Disposes under the commission of E.J. Coleman. The painting reportedly took two years to complete, and Landseer would die less than ten years later in 1873. In one obituary, it is reported that the last year of his life was tormented by horrifying delusions, including seeing a vision of his own funeral that shook him so much he would do nothing other than lay still in bed and indulge in these terrifying images. But when he died, nearly all of London paid respects for his loss. Flags flew at half-mast, chops kept their blinds closed, and the lions of Trafalgar Square, which he designed, held wreaths in their mouths. Despite the last tragic few years of his life, he has been canonized as one of the greatest artists in Britain's history. Okay, I know this is getting kind of long, I get it. But I promise I'm getting to a point here, and there's still one vital piece of context necessary for a fully comprehensive understanding of this painting. And... I dare say this is the most important piece of this puzzle. After all, I'm sure you're wondering whose remains those polar bears have been chewing on. <coughs> ah, nice one. You cannot contest the inestimable benefit which I shall confer on all mankind through the last generation by discovering a passage near the pole to those countries to which at present so many months are requisite. The Northwest Passage. The discovery of a commercial trade route through the Arctic seas over the Canadian tundra was paramount to the colonial Victorians in the 19th century. With this, the British could extend the vainglorious influence of their global empire through trade with East Asian countries without having to sail around the southern tips of Africa or South America. Overland travel had been made difficult by the Ottoman Empire's monopoly of Middle Eastern trade routes, so other options had to be explored. The hope that a channel existed in the Arctic that was simply waiting to be discovered led to several expeditions northward, many of which resulted in the British colonization of present-day Canada and the attempted and ongoing physical and cultural genocide of its indigenous peoples. The bulk of these expeditions resulted in failure, as at the time there was no single channel that led through the Arctic. The Northwest Passage didn't exist. Well, at least not through most months of the year, because of the sheer amount of unnavigable ice flows between islands that made sea travel impossible other than like a few weeks in the late summer, and even that period of melting was unreliable at best. But of course, that wasn't known at the time, so it didn't stop anyone from trying. And one of the most famous of these expeditions was that of Sir John Franklin in 1845. Yet, Franklin isn't famous for succeeding in his mission. Oh, no. His journey had, well, a much darker conclusion. But let's not get ahead of ourselves, of course. Context is everything. John Franklin was no stranger to the frozen north. 
A lifelong sailor and Navy man, his first excursion as a commander to the Canadian Arctic was the 1819 Coppermine Expedition. This, this journey wasn't quite as memorable as his later one, as he made it home, but his return came up 11 members of his company short, out of a total of 20. Most of these men died of starvation, the survivors having lived off of lichen, rotting deerskin, and the leather in their clothing. It is more than likely that they all would have perished several times over if not for the assistance of the Inuit peoples. The entire trip was fraught with drama and disaster, primarily due to Franklin's horrible mismanagement. The crew and their voyageur guides were pushed to the absolute physical and mental limits, and some were even driven to murder and suspect each other of cannibalism. Okay, this shit was buck wild. And there is further reading in the description below for those of you who are interested. Despite failing to discover Northwest Passage and the expedition being what they call in the industry a colossal fuckaroo, Franklin was lauded as a hero upon returning to his homeland in 1822. At least the expedition mapped hundreds of miles of coastline. So instead of focusing on the failed primary objective of the journey, the public saw his efforts as feats of courage and dubbed him the man who ate his boots. All mention of murder and cannibalism were swept under the rug. These were civilized men after all. Nothing like those. Franklin led another expedition to the Canadian North in 1825s, and while still unsuccessful, he was much better prepared, and therefore this one's much less interesting to talk about. It wouldn't be until 20 years later, in 1845, that Franklin would set sail for his final voyage across the pond. This time, Franklin's company would not consist of just 20, but 129 members, and he would lead two ships with state-of-the-art icebreakers, the HMS Terror and the HMS Erebus. If you ask me, if you're using one ship literally called Terror, and the other being named after a Greek titan known for being darkness incarnate, you're kind of asking for a bad time. One newspaper on the day of Franklin's departure was so confident in this expedition that they reported it as if the explorers were already returning, having found the Northwest Passage. The Victorian public at large believed that nature could not hold a candle to the hero who had faced it once before and returned unscathed, especially now that he was equipped with the latest and greatest scientific developments of the last 20 years. Franklin's ships set out from Kent, stocked up in Scotland, and then crossed the Atlantic. The intrepid adventurers were spotted by some whalers between Greenland and Baffin Island, and then they vanished. The trip was planned to take about three years, so no one batted an eye in 1846 or 1847 when no news of Franklin's crew was heard. But come early 1848, Lady Jane Franklin, John Franklin's wife, pleaded with the Admiralty that a search party be sent. Eventually, the Admiralty relented, kickstarting a search for information about what exactly took place during Franklin's lost expedition, a search that is still ongoing to this day. It wasn't until 1850 that the first remnants of Franklin's crew were found when search parties discovered the graves of John Torrington, John Hartnell, and William Brain at a location assumed to be a winter camp from early in the party's travels. There was no message of any kind left at the gravesite, yet, despite this ill omen, Franklin was alive until proven otherwise and in 1852 was given a promotion to Rear Admiral of the Blue despite his absence. Evidently, back home, Franklin was still being touted as a hero, with the probability of his journey ending in failure clearly being impossible. Come 1854, John Ray, a Scottish surgeon working for the Hudson's Bay Company, joined in one of Britain's search parties. He was known for having good relations and respect for the indigenous people that he came across, which unfortunately was a rarity among his exploring contemporaries. After several years searching and spending hard winters in the Arctic, he crossed paths with a group of Inuit families who had been traveling and trading. Some of the goods they had in their possession were recovered relics of Franklin's crew. They hadn't seen the men firsthand, they knew of others who had. And with the testimony of these indigenous peoples, Ray finally learned the dark fate of Franklin's crew. York Factory, Hudson's Bay. September 1st, 1854. Sir, I have the honour to report for the information of the Governor, Deputy Governor, and Committee that I arrived here yesterday with my party all in good health, but from causes which will be explained in their proper place without having affected the object of the expedition. 
At the same time, information has been obtained in articles purchased from the natives, which prove beyond a doubt that a portion, if not all, of the then survivors of the long-lost and unfortunate party under Sir John Franklin had met with a fate as melancholy and dreadful as it is possible to imagine. In the spring, four winters passed, about forty white men were seen travelling in company southward over the ice, and dragging a boat and sledges with them. None of the party could speak the language so well as to be understood, but by signs the natives were led to believe the ship or ships had been crushed by ice, and that they were then going to where they expected to find deer to shoot. From the appearance of the men, they were then supposed to be getting short of provisions. At a later date, the same season, but previous to the disruption of the ice, the corpses of some thirty persons and some graves were discovered on the continent, and five dead bodies on an island near it. Some of the bodies were in a tent or tents, others were under the boat, which had been turned over to form a shelter, and some lay scattered about in different directions. Of those seen on the island, it was supposed that one was that of an officer, as he had a telescope strapped over his shoulders, and his double-barreled gun lay underneath him. From the mutilated state of many of the bodies, and the contents of the kettles, it is evident that our wretched countrymen had been driven to the last dread alternative as a means of sustaining life. Cannibalism. To the Victorians, few sins could be considered more horrific. They were the civilized ones after all, and no queen-loving countrymen, especially not the heroes sailing with Sir John Franklin, could possibly commit such a heinous act. The Admiralty shunned John Ray for his findings, though they did award him the promised sum for finding evidence of what happened to Franklin. Ray's letter was published in a newspaper against his initial intentions, and the British public was aghast. Lady Franklin, who had spent the last several years mythologizing her late husband's status as a hero, contacted a personal friend of hers, Charles Dickens, to rebuke his findings. Dickens' words held a lot of weight at the time, and what he said would easily sway the public's opinion. Dickens attacked Ray for trusting the word of the Inuit, spouting some obscenely racist ideas that I will not repeat here and have nothing to say about other than, God bless us everyone. Ray spent much of the rest of his life having to defend his findings, and he eventually died without the same commendations that his equally accomplished contemporaries received. What Dickens said both validated and comforted the people. The man who ate his shoes was a hero. It's not like someone else's foot was still in there when he was chowing down. The next decade saw a rise in publications of journals from those searching for Franklin, giving detailed accounts of their journeys in the most civilized manner possible for the armchair explorer to base their opinions off of. One of John Ray's responses to people who would refute his claims after reading periodicals and not actually going to the Arctic went as such. Your leader says that discipline would have prevented men having recourse to cannibalism. I do not believe that any discipline would eradicate the cravings of nature, and it is all very well for those who probably have never spent 24 hours continuously without food in their lives to enlarge most indignantly on the subject. Damn. Go off, John Ray. This is for you, bud. In any case, more and more bits and pieces of Franklin's story were uncovered over the following years, including a note that had been hidden away in a cairn dated April 1848, which recorded that the Erebus and Terror had been trapped in the ice for a year and a half at that point, and 24 officers and crew had died by the time that note was written. Franklin himself was among the listed dead, having passed away on June 11th, 1847. The remaining 105 men were to continue southwards. Other searchers continued to find evidence, and over the next 170 years, more and more pieces of the puzzle were discovered. In the 1980s, with modern technology, it was proven among autopsied remains that the crewmen had lethally high doses of lead in their systems, the source of which remains unclear. Ultimately, what killed the crew was starvation, scurvy, pneumonia, lead poisoning, and the cold. But among some of the remains found, definitive evidence of cannibalism scarred the pot-polished and marrow-scraped bones, proving John Ray's macabre initial report correct.
So why is all of this important? We were talking about a painting with a spooky story behind it, and now we know the real-life spooky story that inspired the painting. But what do we do with it all? Okay, well, let's take another look at the painting. Two polar bears have come across a lost whale boat from the HMS Erebus. The bones the bears chew are those of Victorian heroes, and the flag they tear is the Royal Navy's red ensign. This scene was dramatized from the mind of Edwin Landseer in the last decade of his life. With all that in mind, the title of the painting says all the rest. Man proposes, God disposes. Once again, feel free to pause the video and take it all in. Or if YouTube has compressed the image into a blurry pulp, take a second to Google a high-res version with everything that you already know about the painting in mind. If you dare. Yes, I'm Dracula now. This is blood. Tasty. This particular image was inspired by a scene in the published findings of Sir Francis Leopold McClintock, one of the explorers searching the Arctic for evidence of Franklin. One passage in the book describes the moment when McClintock's party stumbled upon the remains of two of Franklin's men in a whaleboat, which, by the state of their skeletons, were deemed to have been devoured by some kind of predator, either wolves or bears. It also describes several relics that were recovered, three of which Landseer included in his painting. A blue coat from a naval uniform, a red ensign, and a broken telescope. The symbolism of the red ensign being mauled by the angrier bear speaks for itself. Although I'll admit, when I first saw the painting, I didn't quite realize it was a flag. I thought it was flesh that this gnarly-ass bear was pulling the skin off of some unfortunate schmuck. I don't necessarily think it was unintentional that someone might take it that way. I mean, Landseer spent much of his youth tearing the skin off of animals in order to dissect them. The broken telescope, however, despite being easy to miss as it is relegated to the bottom corner of the painting, was a political statement in itself. Objects like telescopes and globes were emblematic of the ambition of the Victorians and their imperial rampage. To see one crushed and forgotten was a signal of the defeat of the empire. While this painting was horrific, shocking, and obscene to Landseer's contemporaries, some have mentioned that it was still a softening of the true events, as being eaten by a polar bear is marginally less disturbing than being eaten by another human being. This painting was, in essence, a confirmation of Dickens' proposals, though perhaps the bears were emblematic of what Franklin's men had become, that those who would crunch on the bones of men were no more than beasts themselves. I mean, the one that's gnashing at the bones looks a little too happy to be crunching away at his McRib there, you know? Maybe Landseer did that on purpose. I don't know what Landseer's thoughts were as he was painting this image. Maybe in his declining mental state, he identified with the devoured crewmates. The drawing I mentioned earlier, My Last Night's Nightmare, depicts a lion eating a person bearing Landseer's likeness. The pose and position of the lion seem to be quite similar to that of the rightmost bear. It's clear that Landseer was suffering deeply, and to see how he expressed his pain through his art is heartbreaking. Or perhaps this is simply an image of hell haunted by demons and ooky spooky ghosts who whisper to students during exams specifically, unless they're covered up by a Union Jack so you can't see them, then they're not there, and you can just write your exams without having to worry about any scary bears. I don't believe the story about the student who committed suicide during an exam. There's no evidence to suggest that that's anything more than an urban legend that is intended to creep people out. But what I do know is that this work of art has something to say beyond its reputation as a haunted painting. What I see when I look at this painting are the ambitions of colonial power. This painting gazes upon an almighty imperial empire and spits in its face. Civilization was paramount to the Victorians, but when confronted with an unfamiliar, hostile environment that was never supposed to be civilized, their supremacy crumbles. If this is all their civilization amounted to, maybe their way of life wasn't really all that superior to the people that they committed genocide against. And furthermore, you can try and take everything, exploit every possible resource, and attempt to conquer nature, but nature does not care. Nature will have the final say. This ice may be melting today, and the descendants of those bears may be an endangered species. But sooner or later, if nature isn't treated with respect, it's gonna clap back harder. And that's the horror of this painting, that if you try to push limits that were not meant to be pushed, the consequences could be disastrous. But when I look at this painting, I also see a piece of Edwin Landseer, someone who was hurting deeply in a time when that hurt was not understood in the same way it is now. 
Landseer climbed to the top of the world with his art, and it was good for a while, but eventually his whole life fell apart. And with all the rumors, speculation, and criticism, it must have felt like being devoured alive. That is heartbreaking. There is only a cold, empty, white landscape resembling a canvas that had been cast aside, with dark skies, the hungry expectations of patrons demanding he produce more art suited to the tastes of their nation, and the critics that would assign it value. Maybe this piece was a cry for help just as much as it was a violent rejection of all of those expectations. I don't know if that's the truth, but it's what I see. I think the story of Edwin Landseer's life and the story of Franklin's doomed expedition are far more interesting than the ghost story. It's scary, sure, but what does it leave you with? A spooky painting that's evil just because? To me, the phrase, the bears made me do it, and the tactless dramatization of suicide seems like something straight out of a creepypasta. It might send an errant shiver down your spine, but that's it. If that's all it's ever known for, then it's worth a little more than its entries in haunted paintings listicles. But Man proposes, God disposes, has so much more to say and offer the world. I think I know what ghosts actually haunt this painting. Edwin Landseer left a piece of himself behind in this work of art. He evoked the ghosts of the people who suffered during the final days of the Franklin Expedition, and his spirit lingers alongside theirs as this painting lives on in the exam room of the Royal Holloway. And those spirits aren't causing bad luck or driving students to harm themselves. They're the sinking feeling in your gut as your eyes dance across the canvas. They're that little bit of dread you feel and the emotions you experience as you walk away. The haunting of man proposes, God disposes, isn't the manifestation of a long dead spirit or a controlling otherworldly force. It's the connection you have with that piece of Landseer's soul he has put into that painting. And whatever it means to you. Thank you for coming to visit my Haunted Gallery's grand opening. I hope you've enjoyed your stay, and would absolutely love to see you here again someday. On your way out, feel free to pick up a subscription, leave a comment card with your thoughts in the box down below, and smash that goddamn like button. I have been your host, Emmett Hanley, and it's time to turn out the lights. Okay, so uh, it's about 3 a.m. right now. I've just finished editing this thing. Uh, for the most part, there's still a couple of things I have to do. Um, thank you for watching all the way till the end. Um, <laughs> uh, I know it was long, uh, and I know that there are some problems with the video. Next time I do something like this, I'm going to have to turn down the gain on my mic and uh, mess with some of the camera settings so I get a better image. Um, and also read lines in a way where I won't have to edit the heck out of <laughs> the awkward pauses and things. But yeah, um, uh, please uh, like and subscribe. This is, I, I already said that in the video, but um, I don't know if this is going to go anywhere or if I'll be making any more of these, but uh, I would like to. Um, I'd like this to maybe be a series on this channel and um, where I can talk about art that I like and spooky things um, and but I don't think that'll be everything that this channel will be I'm hoping that maybe I can move on to talking about like movies and games and anime if I ever feel like just going full weeb <laughs> on main um, I do have uh, another project in the works that I've already started on that I'm pretty excited for um, which m might be coming out by the end of the month. I'm not going to promise that. It'll probably be early March. Yeah, uh, big thanks again to uh, Trevor and Connor and Laura, um, Trevor and Connor, for script consultation and their voice lines. Um, you can check out uh, the link to Connor's channel in the description down below. And uh, thank you to Laura for all of that beautiful outdoor footage. Uh, it was gorgeous. And I, it wasn't snowing here, so I couldn't do it myself. Um, you guys are all heroes. Love you all very much. I'm going to go the heck to bed. It's time to uh, turn out the lights. Ooh.